Welcome to Vancouver Business Network, where entrepreneurs learn, network, and grow. I am Roger Killen, the organizer. Our weekly workshop for entrepreneurs is brought to you by TELUS Business, the fastest and most reliable pure fiber broadband network in Metro Vancouver. Our speaker is Neil Godden. Neil trains and coaches business people in marketing, sales, service, leadership, team building, communication, and conflict resolution. He has addressed more than 300,000 people in Canada and the United States. Fellow Vancouver Business Network members and most welcome guests, I invite you now to put your hands together and give Neil Godden a warm, warm VBN welcome. I love presenting at VBN. I love Roger's enthusiasm. Anybody agree? Yeah. We're talking tonight about uh, customer loyalty. And the first question that people ask, no matter what the topic is, is why is that important? You asked yourself that when you decided whether or not to come tonight. And I want to start by sharing a couple of words about the importance of customer loyalty. Um, but before I do that, I want to ask you a question. Has anybody here met the cable guy? Has anybody met the tradesperson who didn't show up on time or left early, didn't clean up? Has anybody ever met that person? Yes. Yes. Have you? <laughs> well, really, that's what this is about tonight. You guys hit it. I was sitting in the back and listening to everybody while you were talking about loyalty and what drives you. And that's what we're interested in, is what drives your loyalty. And what breaks the faith, what breaks the faith. And the reason why, the compelling reason, the driving, the paramount reason why, is that when you think about it, which I do a lot uh, together with my clients, um, when you focus on loyalty, the reason you do so is because you're driving repeat and referral and review sales. In the old days, it used to be repeat and referral. Now it's R, R, and R because you've got to drive those reviews. That's why when you go up and uh, you're sharing, you're hoping, or we're hoping, <laughs> uh, that the people that you share with, and perhaps yourself, will not only leave a comment, but a review. Go over, flip over to Google My Business, go on the directory, and you'll see reviews from customers that love dealing with you as a company, we hope. And if they don't love you enough, we're gonna talk a little bit tonight about how to get your customers loving you more. Why? Once again, why? Well, when you think about it, the oldest marketing strategy in the world is simple referral, word of mouth business, repeat and referral, and these days review. Why has it persisted over all these years with all the other channels and the, all the other avenues for marketing? Well, because nothing is more effective Social media just reinforces everything that we already know. What have they proven and what do all the studies show? No matter who is doing the analytics, what does it show? People trust their friends and family more than they trust their advertisers. We know that. We know that. So we get the benefit of the most powerful strategy in the world, the only one that's persisted through all the ages and through all the changes and all the technology means nothing. In fact, the higher the technology gets, the higher the touch has to be. High touch offsets high technology. High touch, what does that mean and why? Once again, why, 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 why? Well, what is loyal repeat, referral, and review business actually worth? What, you know, what's the big deal? I work with companies and organizations of all sizes and kinds from banks and oil companies to mom and pop uh, solopreneurs and i love everything but one of my not one of my my favorite activity my favorite client isn't an ordinary business on the street that's doing okay it's a client a company an organization that's in absolute crisis it's an existential crisis and it's called turnaround work and uh, how many of you have seen me work before, have worked with me or clients? Hands up? Yeah, probably about a third of the room tonight. Repeat and referral. Mm -hmm. Glad to see you. Um, uh, 
when I'm working with, uh, with clients in crisis, we have some imperatives that you don't run into in everyday, <laughs> in everyday life. We got to do it now. It's got to work now. It can't work later. It can't maybe work, but maybe it works sometime. Or maybe we try it. No, it has to work now in the real world with real people in real time. And I love it. I love it because I love the challenge. I love seeing results happen really quickly. But most of all, I love to see what happens as people flower. They come out realizing that there is no other force within the organization except the human force. It's not a company that's in crisis. It's a group of people that are in crisis. Their everything is at stake. Their mortgage, their housing. We got mortgage brokers here tonight. You know what I'm talking about. Their investments, their future, their pension. The owners, their houses are on the, on the, on the block, typically with the bank. This has got to work. So what do we do? Well, we call this the easiest, the most effective uh, route to building business, but we don't say it's the fastest. If you've got pockets full of money, you can perhaps do it faster if you were to spend a whole lot of money on advertising. There ain't no money for advertising, none, and there ain't none coming. What we got is what you see when you look around you, right? what's left of the inventory, what's good enough about the machinery, and everything that you mentioned earlier is really the only uh, driving additional force that we got, and that's the human beings. So in addition to everything else that we talked about, commitment management, you know, um, you talked about under-promising and over-delivering. Uh, Alex and his organization, are, I'm delighted and proud to say, are one of my clients, uh, where we just work so hard from inside, deep inside the factory here in Richmond to way outside where the customers live and interact and work with the franchisees, people like Alex. Um, and what we see in a turnaround are people beginning to live it instead of lip it. The lip service and the platitudes and the slogans. You walk into a bank branch and you see a slogan on the wall. It's our people that make the difference. Oh, everybody else has got ordinary people. These ones come in from Mars every day for a shift. Maybe not. Maybe not. No, in a crisis, we have to actually deliver. We got to put it out there. And that comes from inside. I actually call it marketing from the inside out. It depends on how we feel, how certain we are about our commitments before we make them authentic, never overpromising. Managing, I call it listening to what I'm about to say before I say it. Before I say, well, yeah, that's a 33-day turnaround. Before I say that, I, I think, wait a minute now, uh, I better warn them that sometimes the truck uh, doesn't get a full load, it goes out the next morning. All right, that could make it three and a half or four days. Where I catch myself thinking in advance and thinking, if I don't tell them that, what will the consequences be? What happens if I say three and it's four or five and they're disappointed? What will happen? I lose. What do I lose? I lose them as a customer. What? Is that all? No. I lose R, R, and R. R, R, and R. Repeat, referral, review. It's gone. Yeah, is that a big deal? Well, yes, when you stop and do the numbers. We do the numbers with every client that I work with, of any size, of any kind. What is your average sale per year per customer? Let's say it's $1,000. And an average customer stays with you for a length of time of four years. Kind of like real estate, right? In four years, that means that their, their retail sales value to you is $4,000. Well, you sure don't want to lose $4,000 worth of business, do you? But you haven't even touched the surface yet. What if they are so delighted with the quality of service, the quality of product, everything that you folks talked about earlier, that they chat with their friends about you? You wouldn't believe. I just had... Um, Storex organizing systems through our closet. I can't believe, I can't believe what they did. I mean, there's one thing to get a quote at an estimate, but then, I mean, it just dazzled us. 
And then this fellow Alex showed up with a wine basket, a gift basket of really good wine. I mean, it's just, it's just crazy, right? It's just crazy. And the person that they're talking to says, you know, we've got to get our mudroom done and we've got to get that pantry done. We've got to do the home office. Do they do home offices? I'm not sure, but I, if, I bet they do. Ask them. Here's his number. That's the return, not just the return, but the repeat review. Now, so let's say that happens once a year over four years because you also get the return. Well, that's 4,000 per person referrals times four times 16 times, uh, then who do they, uh, uh, what's it worth? Now you think we've got it. Now you've got the value, right? No, <laughs> no, we're just beginning. Uh, because look at this. If you get a customer off advertising or drive by or however you might get a, a customer, customer acquisition, you're going to have to get into a sales cycle. You're going to have to, first of all, convince that prospective customer that you're worth even talking to for somehow. Right? And it's a very competitive world out there. And it gets more competitive all the time. So you get into this long sales cycle, meeting and fit finding and interviewing, caring, demonstrating, doing a lot of work and maybe getting the customer. If you're dealing with Rod, who's already worked with you before, and he gives you a call and says, I'm going to need X, Y, Z now. And so, you know, we're still absolutely crazy delighted with ABC, but X, Y, Z is our next need. Can you help us? You bet I can. When will we set up a meeting? The sales cycle goes from up to six months down to six hours or six minutes. The person is pre-sold. We don't have to figure out, we don't have to worry about sticker shock, we don't have to worry about anything. The sales cycle collapses like this. You know what that's worth to you as a business person? That means that in the same amount of time it would take you to do one sale, you could do two sales or three sales. So you're making more and more sales with less and less selling. Now, that's only part of it. When you are referred, when one of your happy, delighted customers refers you to somebody else, they're coming to you pre-qualified. You get somebody a cold lead who's coming in off advertising or saw your something on the internet or whatever it might be, you're starting from scratch, you're starting from zero. You gotta qualify them, they've gotta qualify you. Uh, price sticker shock, do you, do you delicately talk about price up front when they call or email? What, 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 you got a lot of work to do. And you know what the attrition rate is for every one sale that you get. How many sales do you get the, 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 the um, I want to say the bait, that's not the right word. You get the lead, but don't get the sale. Is it one in two, one in three, one in five? One company I worked with in Prince George was one in 40, where they had to do a full quote on each one of those 40 with salespeople lined up at the door of the estimating department. I mean, I mean, that's crazy. It's insane. And we've changed that instantly. But the point is that your referred customers come to you pre-qualified. They know all about you. They know how wonderful you are. They know about your pricing. They know about your service strategy. They know your reputation for honesty and trustworthiness. They know you all, you don't, you don't have to worry about them having, to, where you have to tell a little white lie to somebody in order to make them think that we can do it faster than somebody else, for example. We don't need any of that because your reputation now has been spread for you. You've designed your own reputation. You've decided how your customers want to be described by you to their friends and neighbors and associates. And you've lived up to that profile that you've created you fulfilled your reputation and they know all about it. They come to us totally ready to buy in most cases. The failure rate in those sales is what? It drops from 80 or 60 or 40 or 30 to a much smaller number, whatever that realistically might be. Very few people in my uh, experience have ever really got into it to figure it out. 
to really understand it. Not only is there a monetary benefit, a business benefit, but there's a highly important, at least to me, personal benefit. Because when you operate at that level of integrity, it feels pretty good. Yes, you get the material rewards, but you get another kind of reward that I think is extremely fulfilling and that I think more and more of us are looking for all of the time. And it's one of the reasons why I appreciate Roger always referring to authenticity and let's not make promises when we're networking that we can't fulfill. Let's listen to what we're about to say before we say it. This is how you cross the divide from platitude to performance. This is how it happens, from platitude to performance, to consistently doing what, you're say, what you say you're going to do. So those are just some of the benefits. Um, but there's another thing too uh, that I worry about, you know, when it comes to losing customers. How many of you in this room have lost a good customer? And perhaps never understood why? Anyone? Yeah, I see <laughs> timidly hands raising. Wish I knew why, don't know why. We're just kind of left wondering what on earth happened? Come on, honestly, how many of you? All right, right, right. So <clears throat> we want to cut that number dramatically. And uh, in the next few minutes, we're going to talk about some of the strategies that uh, we've applied. I talk about the turnaround environment because it's such a, for me, a fabulous learning laboratory, a learning environment, learning of what works, what doesn't work. And so the highlights that I'm sharing with you tonight are mainly from that environment. But I must say that the practices and the principles, the disciplines, and the word is discipline. It's the right word. It's, it's not a casual thing. Uh, applies to business of any kind in any condition. Whether, and whether it's service, retail, trades, or whatever it might be. I tell my clients in the trades, by the way, getting back to the cable guy, that the fact that the trades have a terrible reputation for letting customers down could be the biggest competitive advantage that you've got. All, right? All you have to do is design your own reputation, cut yourself in the crowd, get out of that crowd, get up and out of there, and perform differently. Be the force that makes a difference in the minds of your customers when it comes to the trades. So, um, by the way, before I move on, has anybody ever lost a customer before you even got started? Before you even did the job or sold the, the service or the product? Anyone? Yeah. So one of the first things that I like to encourage people to do when we're talking about customer loyalty and all the benefits and so on, is to take a really hard look at how you may be losing customers unnecessarily before you even start. And I'll tell you just a couple of the real highlights. When we get a lead, a new prospective customer, we're asked to develop a quote, you know, do some work. And, uh, you know, justify in the minds of that potential buyer the reasons for dealing with us. Um, but unless we're really, really careful, we can get ourselves blown out of the water before we even start because we may not know some of the key things that destroy customer confidence right from the beginning. For example, have you ever made um, a sales call or, or a meeting that was just perfect, where absolutely everything went absolutely perfectly? It was like dealing with an old lost cousin, uh, you know, rekindling a relationship. You felt right, everything was on cue. And uh, now you're back at your place wherever you might work, and you're developing the quota, you're doing some design work potentially, depending on your type of business and so on, and you get it all together, you zip it off in an email, and, uh, and of course in the email, a cover note that says, hey, looking forward to speaking with you, and you know, blah, 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 and you don't hear back from the person for a couple of days, and then another couple of days and you think, oh, well, that's strange. You know, I thought he was or she was ready to get going on this right away. Um, so you give them a call, all right? And you leave a voicemail that says, uh, Hi, it's old Neil over here at uh, ABC. 
Um, I just want to be sure that you received the email. I put together a quote for you. I did a couple of little things that uh, I hope that you like with the design idea, this and that. Um, so I'm just following up, just a quick follow-up call. Please give me a call when it's easy. Da, da, da. And no call back. No email back. Not even a confirmation that they got the email. What, 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 what? How many? Anybody? Uh, couple of things. Follow-up calls are nuisance calls. You think they're sales calls, they're not. Don't ever make another follow-up call in your life. Number one. Okay? The only thing you can do to maintain control before the sale is to control communication. Everything I'm talking about tonight is communication, communication, and communication squared. All right? Um, so, when you are going to do a quote, design work, research, whatever, whatever it is, spell out exactly what you're going to do and you set an appointment to review. Now, if you're dealing long distance, then you can use uh, join.me or whatever, and you can review live, but whatever, you make an appointment. The moment you put something in an email, you're giving a gift to all of your competitors. Thank you so much. We really appreciate that because your email goes into the hands of the recipient and then is used to get a better price elsewhere. Very simple. It's very convenient. It's actually extremely helpful to your customer and extremely helpful to your competitors. No, I'm being just a little bit facetious, aren't I? I'm totally exaggerating, right? I would be upset. I would be physically ill if one of my clients sent an email with a quote. So I'm really not being that facetious. <laughs> now, it takes communication, communication, communication to set things up so that that is acceptable. You might explain. Now, I know that a lot of people are, will be sending you uh, emails if you're getting quotes from others and so on. We don't do that. We like to be there front and center with you when you're reviewing the work that we're doing so that we can get your feedback right there on the spot. Then instead of having to go back and forth, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Does that make sense? Communication. In other words, you anticipate a negative response to something, you brainstorm a, a better approach. You make sure it makes real sense. And you make sure it's authentic. And you make sure it's of value to the client, not just a convenience to you. And that integrity and that sincerity shows through. So if you've ever been stood up before you, <laughs> you even start, those are a couple of tips that may just help you. Never leave one appointment, generally speaking. Now, this is not absolute, but generally speaking, don't leave one appointment without setting up the next. Not just the time, place, and the means, the technology, but the agenda. And if there's anything that they're going to do, research on their end or whatever, 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 you spell that out. Then you send a confirming email. You set the whole thing up in advance. Yes, please. Yeah, and I think, uh, I just want to say if you have online clients, uh -huh. how do you um, step that process when you're not face to face? And instead, if you don't have a proposal in hand, mm -hmm. you sit down and talk about it. You know, yeah, it, it is fabulous online. Because what you do is you get it offline as much as you possibly can. Let's get offline with that. All right. Let's get offline. Let's get into detail. Let's not text an email back and forth because then I can't respond. I can't see in real time. Right. And, and, and my question or your question may be easily misinterpreted. Let's talk All right. when, when, as much as appropriate. So, so if my clients are in another country or another place, mm -hmm. any mode that you can talk face-to-face, -face, Zoom or anything? Like that, Absolutely. And Zoom is so good. Okay. So easy. Yeah. Did you have something? No, I wanted to remind you to repeat the question. Oh, of uh, course. Thank you. you are so kind. Yeah. Thank you. The question was, what if you're dealing with somebody online and you've got a long-distance proposal that you're dealing with? Um, so thank you so much for that. Okay, how do you do that with Facebook for you? Like a video call through Facebook face to face? Wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. Let's use the technology. But remember, remember, high touch with the high tech, right? 
uh, email and text are just too cold. Any kind of communication that's important, uh, I think is uh, compromised, can be compromised. I don't want to say absolutes, but can be compromised with that technology. Facebook or Messenger. Fantastic. Fantastic. Okay. Uh, so I've talked a little bit about what it costs in hard dollars. Now, what do we do? Okay, so the first thing is that we set ourselves up to succeed. And what I mean by that is we plan for Murphy. Murphy's Law, anything that can go wrong will go wrong eh, to Murphy. <laughs> eh. So what we do and again, this is another trick that we learned, that I learned doing the turnaround work. We cannot afford, when we're up against a wall and it's now or never and it's gotta work, we can't hold an open house, for example, uh, for customers and their friends in order to networking, business building, uh, reinforcement event. If, uh, you know, if the, house, if, if the building burns down, if we're in a building, yeah, but we can't do this. So we've got to go to dramatic lengths to make sure that Murphy doesn't ru ruin our party. And how do we do that? It's actually not that complicated. We plan for Murphy. <laughs> We're not silly enough to think that he's not going to try to invade the party. We fully anticipate and expect that he'll be there. So what we do is a post-mortem as a pre-mortem. <laughs> Before the event, we get together, so often happens in a room like this or a small office or a factory floor or wherever it might be, and I put up the flip chart sheets, old fashioned hand doing flip chart sheets, and I say, okay, what can go wrong? <laughs> and we name the categories, this, 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 all the way around the wall. And then we just start brainstorming. And, I, and the idea is that we keep adding to it. And every time that we add something to it, we say, okay, does that need an action plan? Right? We, we, we just can't fool around. And of course, when you take the simple principle, <clears throat> this discipline, it's time consuming, and you apply it to a healthy business, it works, of course, the same way. But the key is that when Murphy thinks that he is planned for and invited, well, that's no fun. So Murphy goes to play at somebody else's party. All right, simple like that, simple like that. How many people have ever had Murphy show up at one of your events? Oh, yeah. Mm. <laughs> and he brought his relatives. <laughs> and he brought his relatives, right? And they moved in, they moved all the table tents, got rid of the name that was on it and uh, put their names in there. Well, Obviously, obviously, things can always go wrong. Uh, my attitude over the years now doing this <clears throat> and working with all the kinds of clients that I do is that I used to see problems as a challenge, as a real difficulty, not as, not as a challenge, but as a, as, as a problem, frankly, you know? I, but I can't, I can't afford to see problems that way anymore. And I honestly don't. When I see a problem that we hadn't anticipated, then I say, hey, what an opportunity. Now, here's a little trick for you. If somebody has made a mistake and it's left the door open, the back door open for Murphy, huh, then I don't see it as an opportunity to use it as a teaching moment. How many times have you heard that, that, that phrase, teaching moment? You all familiar with that? No. I've reversed that in my life, and I ask my clients to do the same, or the same with my audiences. No. Think of it as a learning moment. A learning moment for the employee? No! <laughs> you numbskull! A learning appointment for you, Neil! Ha! Huh. If somebody didn't learn and I taught, then who owns the problem? If somebody's in the wrong place doing the wrong job or got overwhelmed or whatever, whose system's got a flaw in it? Right? So when we learn to introspect, we learn to challenge ourselves honestly and authentically, uh, then opportunities present us with ways of getting past the next round of Murphy because there will always be another round. This guy that is resilient, you talk about resilience, you're talking about Murphy. This guy is not easily put down. 
but he can be put down. How do we do it? Over the years, we've developed the 3P approach, and it is just as powerful, I believe, now as it has been for many, many years out there. Simple, the 3P approach. Predict, number one. There's very few things that can happen, go sideways, uh, that can't be predicted. Yeah, let me give you a quick example. A building supply store in Kamloops in a turnaround some years back. And uh, I said, so what drives your customers crazy? What breaks the faith in terms of loyalty? People showing up to pick up an order. They've driven in, you know, Kamloops is out in the country. They've driven in maybe two hours from Barrier Lake or whatever it might be. And their order's not ready. Order's not ready. How could that be? Well, some, well, to many, many reasons. Something was not in stock. If we had to order it from Vancouver, they may not have had stock. Truck could have broke down. You know, people have to understand, Neil. I don't think people have to understand. I don't think so. I think we better shape up, right? So within, say, and, and the example that they gave me was this fellow that literally drove in from Barrier Lake, uh, picking up a, a house, uh, building materials for a house that he was uh, constructing, had a crew back there showing up at one o'clock. He's there at 11 in the morning uh, when the truck is supposed to arrive. Huh? There ain't no truck. And as far as the store knows, hopefully it's on its way. Hopefully. Right. So they're phoning the store or the, the warehouse in Vancouver in Cloverdale here. And uh, they're not sure what's happened. Right, so we got a problem. We got a problem. How easy it would have been to predict that a truck may have been broken down or short shipped or whatever. How easy. So if we just listen to what we're about to say before we said it, we wouldn't say to that rancher, your order will be ready at 11 o'clock you know, on Wednesday, which is what they did. We would have explained the whole thing way back when we were starting, starting to build the relationship. We would have explained that in this business, things happen. So you've got a plan. You know, if you've got a crew coming in, for example, uh, to do your framing, please phone us and ascertain that everything is going to be on schedule. We will do everything in our power to phone the suppliers, get them to phone their suppliers, get them to go right down and up the chain, um, you know, and we'll provide you with our home telephone numbers. So if it's Sunday morning at five o'clock and you've got a crew and something's missing or you need something, we're going to be there one way or another somehow. Um, but we've got to work together. Huh? Um, now, it may sound like I'm sort of uh, exaggerating the extents to which we would go. No, 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 no. Working with BC Hydro at one time, engineering department. Um, I don't think this is telling stories out of school, but it just remind, just hit me as I'm thinking about it right now. Having a lot of challenge with some of their departmental customers um, when for, for real good legitimate reasons, uh, the engineering department couldn't fulfill something on time. Uh, so looking for solutions. And I said, well, what do you do at your briefing sessions? Do you spend enough time at your briefing sessions, your project planning and management briefing sessions? Or what? Well, of course, departments and so on would have had their preparation meetings, but together, everybody in a room getting to know each other and what their cell numbers are and who's their assistant is, their associate is, when their holidays are, when they're going to be on a break. We're not talking about $10,000 jobs here. We're talking about millions and millions of dollars and time frames that are extremely sensitive. Um, that same principle and practice applies with the smallest of small businesses. Let's get together and talk about how we're going to talk as the job goes along and what, well, how we're going to communicate with each other, who will we, we reach, how will we reach them, uh, where people are going to be, who's responsible for what, who their second in command is, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Who do I report to if you're ill for the day uh, because this is a time-sensitive project that we're on, whatever it might be. It could be this, you could be a solopreneur. You don't have to be a huge megacorp in order for these rules to apply. 
and you cut things off at the pass. So that's the three P approach, predict, proact, obviously, proact. And um, over the years I've developed a simple thing called the action system. In a typical meeting with my clients now, nobody is making copious notes and we don't have the minutes of the meeting. We have a one page uh, laminated agenda. Uh, and basically it says, what are we here to talk about? All right, who's here? What are we here to talk about? And uh, the brainstorming begins, All right? We brainstorm the topics, which one's the highest priority. We brainstorm the highest priority, get consensus on the highest priority. Then we just take one item after the other. We brainstorm ideas on how we're gonna solve it, how we're gonna en en enact it. And those go into an action plan worksheet that says who commits to do what by when, and then there's a column for start, complete, and then a tick, I call them for a tick mark. That's it. That's how we hold meetings. That's it. All we're interested in is what we're going to do. And my feet are inching over this little box that uh, Roger described to you earlier. So we're proacting. We will do the same kind of action meeting before there's a problem. As I mentioned earlier, when we're starting something, or in particular when we're doing a turnaround, you know, where we, every resource has got to be identified, utilized, accessed, people are engaged. You hear about engagement all the time, but it's another slogan. Real engagement means that marketing from the inside out, doing this from the inside out because I want to, I feel compelled, and I feel that, that sense of, of, of real, authentic uh, teamwork for the people I'm working with. Prevent. We can predict, proact, prevent virtually anything. And the people that I work with, it's, it's like a theme song. Well, just 3P at it. Just throw a 3P and let's get that out of the way. Just 3P it. Just 3P it. That's it. That'll take care of that. We, an, an action meeting can be done in a matter of seconds. I also encourage you and everyone that I work with to do stand-up daily meetings and we simply call them the daily so every single day for example at uh, storex organizing every single day in the shelving department art who you know uh holds a, a, a stand up action meeting and we call it the daily and basically he's got four people that he's working with and each one of them goes round robin so nobody can be just quiet and meek and so on uh what have you got in front of you today any challenges that you can foresee, anything need equipment, equipment need attention or whatever, over to the next person, the next person, the next person. Uh, any news that I've got uh, in turn that affects the production schedule for our department, I share briefly. We're talking one minute to two minutes at max, that's it. Well, what we're doing is 3 ping the day's work. Before Art goes and holds that meeting, he goes to the schedule to see what's expected of the group that day. And then, of course, we're directly attacking what's expect the expectations for the day with making sure that there's nothing in the way, making sure there's nothing in the way. So at the end of the day or mid-afternoon, somebody's not saying, well, you know, we could have hit a target or we could have got that on the truck if so-and-so or this or that. No, don't do that. That's crazy. Literally. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm quoting Einstein when I say that, of course, you know what I mean. <laughs> you know what he says, you know, you keep doing the same thing the same way, expecting a different result that could be, you know, the definition of insanity. So planning for Murphy is absolutely the key. And customer experience planning. Just I love. Have you heard the term customer experience engineering? Are you familiar with the term? It is a term that's out there. It's part of the new language. I've been using the, the, the term customer experience planning for the last 10 years or so. It's not as sexy as engineering, <laughs> but it really works well for me and for my clients. What we want to do is we don't want to leave anything to chance. It's like quoting and then, you know, losing touch forever with the with prospective client. It's just crazy, especially if you keep doing it. You know, hoping for a different result. Woo! <laughs> so what we want to do is we want to plan the customer experience. And you begin with the end in mind. Every interaction, 
with any prospective new client, begin with the end in mind. The goal, my purpose, in for, as we form this relationship and conduct our way through this relationship, is at, at the end of our first transaction, our first business together, that we have added one more member to our team of loyal, repeat, referral, and repeat customers. Nothing less, nothing less, and it doesn't matter how small or how large that new customer is, because the person that's buying $50 worth of this today is talking to somebody who's buying $50,000 worth of something tomorrow. This is a challenge. There are estimates. There's no proof, no hard evidence, but there are estimates that it's for every one positive thing that's said about a company to others by a customer, 20 things will be said that are negative. In other words, do anything wrong and it's all over. Right? It's all over the place, especially today on the net. Do anything good, and yeah, maybe. You got to be exceptional. You got to be exceptional. And, and, and this is why it drives us to look inside and say, well, what does that mean? What do I have to do? How do I have to be in order to be truly exceptional, to care that much? Not just to care that much about the customer, but to care that much about my business and myself and my family and my future. This is not casual. This is not casual. In customer experience planning, what we want to do, obviously, is to hit that 20 to 1 mark, that 1 in 20 mark. So when people are talking about us, and again, as I mentioned, I'm talking about designing your own reputation. We decide, you and I, as business people, how we want to be described. We decide. I do it with the team. And when I'm working with a client, I do it with the whole team. Well, how do we want to be described? How do you think we're described now? How would you like to be described? Is there any gap? Do you care? Do you see the value? Uh, the intrinsic and extrinsic value. Okay. <laughs> what are you going to do about it? That's the action plan. What are you going to do about it? Uh, and if you decide that you're going to do something and you execute, then you get that one notch closer. Uh, now this may be a little bit easier to stimulate people talking about you in a positive way. Um, so there's two goals, as I said, raving fans, sales ambassadors, sales ambassadors, people who are out there beating the bushes for you, doing your hard work for you. I get, oh, Here's another example that comes to mind. It's not small business, but it is small business. Um, one of my bank clients, a few years back, does anybody remember when Oak Ridge was being torn down and rebuilt while it was still open? Does anybody remember that? It's a few years back. But it just reminds me of this so much because it was so, so real and so, I don't know, just, oh gosh, encouraging. Um, the entire Oak Ridge Mall was down 50% in sales. Right? It was like a war zone. You couldn't park. You couldn't walk. There's stuff all over the place. It was felt dangerous. Right? And this bank branch was down 50% in the sale of loans, deposits, mortgages, et cetera, et cetera, just like everybody else. And they asked me to go in and see if there was anything we could do. Now, this is a bank that referred turnaround business to me. And now they're asking me to do turnaround work internally for them and I said I would love to and of course I would and I did uh, we went in there we had a ball and I want to share with you a couple of the things that we did because I think if you're like me they'll not only will they really resonate with you but they'll just make darn good practical sense right so for example so the first thing we did was see I asked the manager I said uh, can we invite all of the staff including part-time CSRs customer service representatives and so on to a brainstorm session. We'll do it after work, bring in the pizzas, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, yeah, sure. <laughs> and he said, but you don't want the girls involved, do you? <laughs> I looked at him and said, what? what? He meant the average age, 40, 40 ish girls, the customer service reps, the audit clerks, the desk clerks, and so on. 
I said, are you nuts? That's the front line of the bank. They're the only ones that know what the customers need, what they get annoyed about. They don't, they know everything. <laughs> you know? I, I, I didn't get, um, you know, shrieky like that. <laughs> I tried to retain what I'm like, cool, right? And he said, oh, oh, I guess, yeah, I guess they do. I said, I, you know, I, I didn't say it anymore. Anyway, so we cover the, the, the glass walls of the branch with these flip chart sheets, and I'm just going. I say, okay, we're going to do categories. What do you think we can do about service, lineups, uh, waiting, this, that? And, um, and they came up with a whole bunch of them. So, for example, uh, we said, well, people hate waiting in line um, at 10 o'clock in the morning when the branch opens. They have to, there's lineups. And I made sure we had a regional manager there, so if we needed money, we could get it, you know, like right now. And I said, well, can't we get the transit bag overnight instead of first thing in the morning? He said, oh, yeah, yes, there's no reason. I said, well, you get the transit bag. That's the bag that goes between all banks overnight with the checks and the paper and all the stuff. If you, if you don't get it the day, night before, then you're not, you can't be ready. Well, we got it the night before. It cost a few extra dollars for couriers. Didn't matter. Bang! All the CSR teller positions open 10 o'clock in the morning. Huh? No light up at all. Zip. People hate having to use the ATMs. Oh, okay. Why don't we station somebody in the lineup asking anybody if they'd like help um, learning how to use the ATMs? This is when the ATMs were still coming in. Um, and then... Well, there's so many, but one, oh, one of them was the kids. People hate bringing their kids in, but they have no choice. Well, why don't we do something for the kids? Before that, you never saw kiddies play areas in banks or stores. We were the first, right? So a kiddies play area. Uh, people still hate waiting in line because sometimes there's still lineups. Great, let's put a TV in the lineup. Yes, bang, magical, there's a magic wand, right? As far as I know, the first bank with a television set. Right. And then the crowding achievement. One of the part-time CSRs said, I have an idea. And she said, we have so many languages. This is Oak Ridge. Why don't we put up a sign saying, listing all of our languages and saying, if you'd like an appointment with someone in your own language, please ask any of us. And that was the deal breaker. I mean, we, I could go on and on and on because it was never ending. But that one idea was, I think, at least 50% responsible for what happened. And what happened was this. This was at the bottom of, the, of this Oak Ridge reconstruction. Uh, they were down, as I said, 50%, just like every other business there. Well, I'll tell you what. Within two months, they were back at 100% of sales just like that and more than any other contributing factor was that one idea that came from that part-time CSR and the lesson that I want to share with you there is that for goodness sake don't overlook your people everybody talks about engagement but do it make it real and it, which depends on a word and the word is respect you know if we want to show real respect to our customers and we don't work completely alone, and does anybody really work completely alone? I don't think so. Then we've got to show respect for our customers. How do we do that if whoever we work with doesn't share our level of respect? What if we don't share our level of respect for our customers? In other words, what if we offer lip service to really caring, uh, but deliver a half-hearted service at times? or find ourselves doing a little white lie and excusing, or um, excusing ourselves after the fact instead of taking responsibility. One thing I've learned over the years, particularly in the turnaround environment, is this. Taking responsibility sets us free. Taking responsibility sets us free. Taking responsibility when something goes wrong takes, sets us free. Free to what? Free to avoid the blame game. Well, I could have done that or we could have done that, but the supplier did this or that or this employee did that or this or whatever, and I'm okay. Well, the problem with that is, I call it the victim game, is that the minute you appoint a villain, 
right? We could have done that if except for blaming and shaming, right? Except for, well, at the moment that you appoint a villain, the second that there's a bad guy, uh, what am I? What happens when I appoint a villain? What do I become? Sorry, I couldn't hear it. I become the victim. <laughs> now that that's fine. If you don't mind being a victim, it's great. You get a lot of sympathy, maybe. <laughs> but that's about it. Um, the problem is that the job of a victim is not to solve any problem or do anything that's helpful to self or other. The job of a villain, of a victim rather, is to suffer. It's to suffer. So if you want to solve things, <laughs> set yourself free, free of the victim game, free of the villain game, free of all of that stuff. Take responsibility. I should have taken extra time to qualify that that truck was really on the road because very often we'll be told, and rightly so, that the truck is almost packed, it's ready to roll, but something happens at the last minute. I should have made one last check, my apologies. It sets me free because now I can apologize, now I can rectify, I can, I can use that knowledge for the future. We can all gain. Yes? You bring up a scheduling issue. A lot of what you're talking about is project planning. Uh -huh. How do you plan? How do you always anticipate something going to arrive? Or, or how, how do you address it in the moment? Because sometimes parts are delayed. Yes, but it's the, it's the in advance. Oh, I have to repeat the question. Pardon me. So the question is, I've focused quite a bit on the things that happen, time delays and that sort of thing. Um, do we just deal with it in the moment by taking responsibility or do we try to plan ahead? And my whole thing is the 3P approach, you know, to predict, <clears throat> to proact, to prevent. I'm, told, I'm, I'm the same with conflict. I'm... I'm um, trained in conflict resolution, but I spend 90% of my time when it comes to conflict within teams and so on and leadership training on conflict prevention. Let's get out in front of the action. Let's lead. Let's not follow. Let's not get tangled up in the middle. Let's lead the process. So predicting, predictive problem solving. I'm sure I didn't invent the, invent the term, but it's one that we use every day. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> but I'm delighted at the question. That's the first time I've been asked that. Thank you. Um, no, as you've probably gathered, because I'm talking about flip charts and felt pens and so on, and action plan worksheets, you know, I'm not talking about a spreadsheet usually. So I, I tend to be a little bit more old fashioned. Right. Um, okay, all good. Um, the other piece. Of oh, before I go by here, and I'm not supposed to be looking back at this at the screen, am I, Roger? Huh? Um, okay, where is that? Did I? Oh, I know where it is. I oh, I just wanted to show you the tail end of this slide back here because I didn't mention it to you. Look at the bottom of the slide, and don't forget the last five percent. This is something we've picked up just in the last couple of years. It's really important. Um, one of my clients is a, a company that builds homes in a factory, and uh, they sent a flatbed truck way out into the country to deliver one of these homes. There's the crew waiting for them. The flatbed couldn't get in because when they deterred, because when they walked the road, the the uh, the access road, there was no turnaround. There was no possible way that that flatbed could turn around. Another client get out to a, to a site, these are trades examples for some reason, uh, there was no power. The whole crew had to return. Uh, another client sent a, a, a crew down to repair a cactus club table in downtown Vancouver that had been broken in a fight the night before. Uh, got there as promised at 7 a.m. and there was no one there that, uh, that uh, or whatever time it was. And, you know, just insane. So it's a practice, it's a discipline. Really try to think ahead of time. 
what could go sideways? What's gone sideways before? And then afterwards, post-mortem. Post-mortem, post-mortem, post-mortem. Don't let it go. Don't let it go. Um, try to learn from the experience. Communicate plus communicate. Square the communication. <laughs> you, do, you know, no matter how you come at this, it's interpersonal communication. First, it's intrapersonal and then interpersonal. Before, during, after. During, staying in touch. Don't wait for the client to be calling you. Stay one step ahead of the customer. Lead the process, don't follow it. If you will just focus on that one idea, lead. We're talking leadership here, not followership. Lead the action. You know. And if you don't, you can qualify by asking what your customers are worried about, what they're concerned about, what they fear could go sideways with whatever it is that you provide. Make sure that they don't have those fears. Make sure that you're ahead of them. Make sure that you've got a solution in mind when something does come up. And for goodness sakes, communicate. Afterwards, afterwards, and you'll notice a, a little slip of paper that I put on everybody's seat <clears throat> uh, during the break. Um, I'm starting a blog next month in July, just preparing for it now, on communication, interpersonal communication, conflict prevention, prevention, prevention. Um, and uh, leadership in general. And I'm inviting you to let me know if you'd like to receive those blog posts by email. And uh, I'll add your name to the list. After, what I encourage people to do is to make sure that you remain in front of your clients. And the best way to do that is not with sales calls or follow-up calls or any of that kind of thing. Thank you, handwritten thank you notes, you betcha. Here we are back to the old, you know, the high touch kind of thing, right? Um, but if you will stay in touch with your clients through education-based marketing, you're gonna find it awfully hard to go wrong. You could be building crates for museums, as Rod is here. Uh, you could be doing life skills coaching. It doesn't matter what you do. But if you get on social media, little blips, little tips, helpful hints, things that people can use that are related to your field or your particular product or service, very hard to go wrong. And not only does that bring you the R, R, and R business, it'll also bring you new business from people who have never uh, known anyone who's done business with you before. Why is that? Because you're using part of what's called attraction marketing. I have a simple rule, and you might want to note this or Write it down or just keep it in mind. If I call you, I'm a salesman. If you call me, I'm an expert. Which would you rather be? So I want to, I want to share that thought with you um, in terms of the after. Now, in terms of recovery, because it's going to happen, you want this. I can't believe it. One of my clients said uh, there was a missing part that was in an order on Vancouver Island uh, to their shipment. And it was the weekend. Uh, there's no way, there's no way. So he just threw it in the cab, 50 mile cab, no problem. She couldn't believe it, absolutely couldn't believe it. It was something they needed for a garden party. The next day their daughter was being married on their property, 50 mile cab ride, no problem. Right? So whatever you do, Take total responsibility, no victim game. Costs, investments, 50 mile cab ride, cab ride, no problem. So there's a few thoughts for you on how to communicate effectively in the interest of increasing and enhancing every aspect of customer loyalty and hopefully re reaping, undoubtedly reaping, the, re the rewards. I don't want to suggest, by the way, for one second that you're not already doing an awful lot of these things. My hope tonight is that I can reinforce what you're already doing and maybe add something here and there that you hadn't thought of. Thanks very much. <laughs> oh, yeah, here we, go. <laughs> yeah, here we are. Um, pardon me, the, I, I, a little bit awkward with the slides here tonight. Um, 
What I want to, I've already mentioned to you that I left a little slip inviting you to uh, sign up for my, <clears throat> for my post, if you like. Uh, I also want to mention that uh, I am available for training and coaching. I do a lot of individual one-on-one -on -one coaching with business owners, solopreneurs to larger uh, companies and so on. Um, and I do a lot of communication skill workshops for teams of people in school boards and uh, organizations of all kinds. Love doing that kind of work and uh, welcome your inquiry. There's a little box actually on that piece of paper you can tick if you're interested in learning more. Um, uh, for those who want to contact me uh, to arrange a, a complimentary 30-minute exploratory meeting, uh, if it's local, we do a lot of these meetings live. If not, we do them Zoom, we do them uh, telephone, whatever's, whatever lower, lower tech, higher touch vehicle is available. And of course, you'll see our contact information on the, uh, on the YouTube uh, video as well. Thank you very much to Telus Business as well for recording. Thank you, and thank you, Neil. I just love the three Ps. Mm -hmm. And Telus, thank you very much for making this production possible. Okay.